In this video, I'm going to talk about the role of genre in narrative and storytelling and structure, as well as some other considerations when dealing with longer length stories. In particular, we will be looking at how to identify genre in your field and use it to guide your work, how to use structure and different frameworks in factual storytelling, and we're going to touch on some techniques specific to interviews and interview-based stories. So let's start with the narrative structures. Previously, we looked at Martin Cortazzi's typical narrative structure and how that can be applied to a range of different genres of storytelling. But this week, I want to look at longer storytelling and how length has an effect on format and structure. Now, it's worth making a distinction between three different categories, broadly speaking, in which stories fall. Um, so far, we've really dealt with what you might call medium form storytelling, storytelling that falls into that middle ground of 50 word to 1500 word stories or video packages or radio packages. However, there are also short form storytelling formats, tweets and social media updates where you are counting the length in characters, for example. And our focus today, which is long form writing and documentary length. Um, storytelling, such as in-depth or feature formats. One structure that's useful for thinking about longer form storytelling is Freytag's Pyramid. Freytag's Pyramid maps quite neatly actually onto Cortazzi's structure. We have uh, an exposition stage of the story which is very similar to the orientation phase of, um, of Cortazzi. We have an initial incident which is similar to the complication we have a resolution, which is similar to the result of Cortazzi, and a denouement, which is similar to the coda. But in the middle here, we have um, three different parts which correspond to the evaluation stage of Cortazzi. And this is where we need to stretch the attention of the audience over a longer period. Now we're starting to talk about rising action, some sort of climax, and some falling action. To illustrate this, I want to use Phineas and Ferb. Phineas and Ferb is a cartoon series and the episodes are generally about 20, uh, 25 minutes long and they're very, very formulaic. They follow a very, very similar structure in every episode. In fact, so um, formulaic is it, so structured is it, that even the dialogue gets repeated in different um, episodes. So, for example, in every, every episode, normally Phineas or Ferb will say, I know what we're going to do today. That's the exposition stage of the story. Normally, at some point, there'll be a, a question raised, where's Perry, the platypus in the cartoon? There'll be some sort of initial incident between two characters, Perry the platypus and Dr. Doofenshmirtz, the evil enemy. There'll be some rising action as inventions are made. Um, the older sister tries to get the mother to see uh, the, what they're doing. There'll be some sort of climax where they're about to be revealed to their mother as these uh, closet inventors or Perry the Platypus is about to be defeated. And then there is some falling action after that climax is partly resolved until eventually there is a full resolution. And notably in this particular cartoon, there's often a main plot involving Phineas and Ferb and a subplot involving Perry the Platypus. So these different plot points actually happen across both plots as they cut between them. This is a good example, Phineas and Ferb is a good example because it's a really good example of how genre represents an unspoken agreement between the creators and the audiences about what to expect. The audience of Phineas and Ferb expects certain uh, things to happen in the story to the extent that they even expect certain pieces of dialogue. This is sometimes why the conversion of a cartoon into a film can feel a little bit uncomfortable or it doesn't quite work because it might represent a little bit of a violation of those expectations that we've grown so accustomed to. Now that's not just at the level of program but at the level of a whole genre obviously. Cartoons generally we expect certain things of them, documentaries and other genres likewise. They influence what we choose to include in a story and what we don't include. So, for example, in news, we generally do not exclude any sort of comment from the creator. 
There are obviously lots and lots of examples of genre to draw your attention to, but it's always important to identify what's the genre that you're operating in. Documentary, for example, is a genre, but it's a very broad one, and within that there are lots of sub-genres, so it's worth identifying, are you producing a fly-on-the-wall documentary, or a documentary which is driven by the first person, it's presenter-driven, or is it narrated? In text, you can have listicles or live blogs. These have certain conventions, for example, the stand first and a very linear structure. We'll come on to a stand first example in a minute. Stand firsts are also used in interviews, and there's often uh, an element of colour in an interview that adds some context around the place where the interview is taking place and the person who's being interviewed as well. So you might have details about the, the location and the, the tone of voice being used the expression on the interviewee's face. Reviews have their own generic structure. They summarise to begin with, add some context to the piece of media and conclude at the end. Whereas conclusions don't tend to be included in other genres. The opinion genre, again, has different styles, different things included. There's a much bigger emphasis on personality and the reader is addressed directly in a way that they're not addressed that way in other formats. So just by distinguishing those generic features, it's always worth um, doing the same for any genre that you're going to work on. Don't make the mistake of assuming you know what the genre is. Explicitly look at examples and identify what are the key qualities. And also read around the literature, books, um, behind the scenes stuff, analyses to get a feel for the genre as well. I mentioned about the stand first. The stand first is a really good example of a generic convention that's worth being aware of. These are used in interviews, in listicles, um, in TV and radio packages. And it's normally a sentence that essentially introduces the narrator before the story begins properly. If you like, this is the abstract stage in the narrative structure. So a, a typical example might sound something like, as farmers plan a new protest over plans to leave the EU without a deal, Jane Smith looks at the impact of Brexit on farming. So that's summed up what the story is. It's an abstract from a structural point of view, but it's also introduced the narrator as an actor in the story because she's going to be presenting it or she's going to be part of the story. And also it's structurally what we expect from this genre. So we use this stand first because it's an expectation of the audience, it's part of the genre. With interviews, there are a number of different conventions in terms of headlines, and I want to spend a little bit of time mapping these out because this is useful to know if you're going to do any sort of interview in whatever medium and you need to present it. Um, one common mistake that people make with interviews is to title it with uh, the title An Interview with Jane Smith or an interview with Jim Jones. That's actually not telling a story, it's just labelling what the thing is. So instead you should always be trying to tell a story with your title, with your headline. And a number of different conventions for doing this are listed here. For example, starting with the name followed by a key quote, or a description of why such a body did such a thing, or how such a body did such a thing. There's the list approach to the interview headline, um, the name of a person on this thing, that thing, and the other thing. Or starting with the quote and then naming the person and explaining what they're talking about. You can have headlines that focus on practicalities, how to do this, how to be such a thing. And you've also got call to action headlines where the reader is invited to meet the person who did X. Here are some examples from um, uh, from text articles. So the first example, James Blunt, is a list. James Blunt on Saddam Hussein, pimping his sister on eBay, and Twitter hate. Often there are three items in the list approach. Next we've got the example of the name followed by a quote. In this case we've had to explain who this person is, so we've got NUS President as well, NUS President Malia Boatia, and then the quote. And finally the how someone did something approach. Similarly, the same approaches can be seen in video. This person, this name describes something. Um, 
one woman's experience with. So this is a kind of a how or a why approach. Or finally, Malala Yousafzai on her courage and her new book. This is the list approach again. So consider these generic approaches in your own titling. Moving on to long form storytelling, um, I want to introduce some concepts and some terms that are worth being familiar with in terms of different genres in long form writing. Now the term long form was originally used to refer to anything that was longer than an article but shorter than a book. So it might be 20,000 words, for example. And Kindle singles were created to provide a vehicle for this length of story. Um, but long form has come to mean really anything longer than about 1,500 words or 2,000 words, particularly stories that are immersive or use scrolly telling techniques. And there's also genres in their own right as well. Immersive storytelling is stories that combine text with multimedia, so text and video, text and audio, often with some sort of transition, animation, that sort of thing. And scrolly telling is a similar word for the same sort of genre where um, a story uh, changes as you scroll. And you can see probably the best known example is Snowfall. Snowfall was massively influential. This was a 2012 story about an avalanche and it includes all those sorts of elements of um, video and transitions on screen with things moving in and moving out and it influenced loads of storytellers to, to try and create similar looking features. This then became known as immersive storytelling because it feels very immersive. You've got these big images or videos that bring you into the story. And also this idea of scrolly telling, this idea of you're scrolling through the story, um, initiating some sort of animation or transition on the screen. Uh, a common feature is uh, a looping video or GIF as part of the story, as in this example as well. So it's well worth having a look at some of these examples to familiarise yourself with that genre and look at the structure that they use. Quite often, they will use what's called the kebab structure or kebab structure. In this structure, the story begins with an anecdote. That is essentially the abstract of the story. The anecdote sums up somehow the, the key theme of the story. That's followed by what's called a nut graph. That's where the story is, um, is summed up, the, the, the kind of point of the story is made. Then we have the meat of the story, what happened next. And that carries on until the end of the story where often we return to either the same anecdote that we began with or another anecdote to end with. You can see this structure in the example I showed in a previous video um, about nail bar workers in California. In this case, the anecdote is about um, one particular nail bar worker and her experiences, including a quote. And then we move into the nut graph, the, um, the wider context, the bigger picture that introduces us to the story as a whole. It answers the question, why are we hearing this anecdote? Um, again, in terms of structure, this is an orientation. We're being orientated about the surroundings that this anecdote sits in. So some key points just to sum up there in terms of genre and structure. Basically, you need to make sure that you consider genre in your approach. What genre are you working in? Make sure you have a clear idea of that. And if you're trying to mix more than one genre, then that's quite difficult, first of all, so you need to make efforts to make sure that you're doing the right things and, and getting it right. It's not going to be a mishmash. What are the conventions? What are the elements? What's left out? And look at lots of examples to inspire you and give you ideas. Secondly, consider the structure, um, not just the broad Cortazzi structure, but things like Freytag's Pyramid, where you have that escalating tension towards a climax. How are you going to maintain interest in your audience? And finally, on a, on a very practical level, remember to tell a story in your title. Don't write a title to your story, which is just a label, an interview with X, or you know, a story about this. It needs to tell us what the story is about, who some, what something has, someone has said, what someone has experienced, what the story is about.